Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, for this kind introduction. And I thank the International Association for um, Archaeological Research in Western and Central Asia for the opportunity to present my um, research and especially you, um, Ben Mutin, for the organization of this webinar. Now, I'm especially honored um, since I will take you away from the core region of Arwa's interest, away to Mongolia and South Siberia. And sorry, I have to unclick, I have to move this image away. So, and I will take you to this region which is not even on your map. And um, you may very, very well may ask, uh, why should we bother um, with this region out there? Um, well, Central Asia is so much in the center of uh, Eurasia and a node for many interactions. But in Mongolia, um, the Xiongnu established the first steppe empire between uh, the 209 BCE and 91 CE. And um, I want to first highlight um, a key elements of Xiongnu archaeology to those who might not be familiar um, with it. And I will focus on how we can trace the context and what kind of context we see between the Xiongnu, Central Asia, and even the regions further um, to the west. And when we think about the centuries around the turn of the era, era um, Central and Central Asia and contacts for the east, immediately the discussion about Central Asian influence on China and China's Chinese embassies in Central Asia, as well as the opening of the Silk Road comes to the mind. But current scholarly contentions run the risk of glossing over the steppe inhabitants as passive participants of interactions between large agrarian empires. And this is why in this talk, I want to show you that the Xiongnu were critical agents who helped drive and facilitate global exchange networks that spanned the entirety of the Eurasian steppe uh, region. Now, there are two phenomena that we um, can see archaeologically when it comes to um, the Silk Road and um, the context, the Eurasian context. The first thing is um, we see similarities in style, we see similarities in conspicuous consumption of an elite. Uh, we see a similarity in the elite material vocabulary. And these similarities are shared between Eastern Eurasia, Central Asia, and Western Eurasia. So here from Mongolia to, through Central Asia to the Black Sea area, we can trace similarities. The other thing that we can see is that we see the distribution, a massive distribution of Chinese goods, which we find in burials all across Eurasia. And here I show you a map of Chinese mirrors and Chinese lacquerware and their distribution. And you can see basically three um, clusters, a large cluster uh, in Mon present day Mongolia and uh, Transbaikalia where the Xiongnu established the empire. Then you see uh, somewhat a cluster in Central Asia. And then again, you see um, the area around the Black Sea. You find barriers, more barriers with Chinese um, imported goods. Now let's start out who are the Xiongnu now? I'm, maybe not everybody is familiar. So um, I, I thought I'd give you a, a small overview, a, a very brief rundown. So in 209 BCE, the Chinese chronicles report that those who draw the bow may be claimed as all are Xiongnu. So Sima Chan, who worked at the court of the Chinese um, emperor, he, he wrote that down and from him and other um, chroniclers, we have uh, some information about the Xiongnu. And they also report that we have a, that they have a very so complex social hierarchy with a leader who is called Chanyu and several tiers of kings. We have a left wing and a right wing as well as a central king. Then they report also that there is a capital named Longchang. Um, and they also, of course, report one of the most famous tropes that they are constantly on the move in search for water and pasture for the herd animals. Um, 
their military strength, I mean, um, Modun conquered several neighboring tribes when he started um, establishing the Xiongnu Empire. And this military strength was also then used to, um, to conduct several raids into northern China. And um, they were um, so overwhelming that the Chinese um, sought an appeasement politics, which is called the He Qing uh, Treaty, um, a marriage alliance um, in order to, to, to appease those um, northern neighbors. By the end of the second century BCE, so that was basically a process for a bit a hundred, uh, of about a hundred years, they acknowledged that their um, that their that the He Qin treaties they failed and they waged they started to wage war against the Xiongnu and that lasted um, quite some while. Um, what is very decisive, um, not only in the history but also in the archaeology, is um, that around 50 BCE um, they waged a civil war among the Xiongnu, and um, that disrupted the. Um, uh, contact with China and the treaties with China massively. And um, we know in the aftermath of the civil war, when the Xiongnu split up in several factions, we know that there was a huge desire to, run to return to the Heqing uh, treaties again. Um, so, uh, and by the end of the first century CE, finally the Xiongnu were defeated. <clears throat> by a coalition of Xianbei in concert with Chinese who invaded Xiongnu lands and killed the ruler. And from then on, the, the political um, superstructure had collapsed and we don't hear of the Xiongnu polity again. We, we do hear in various written sources about people that are called Xiongnu, but uh, the polity came to an end. So this is, um, is a story, history of about 300 years <clears throat> And um, uh, interestingly, what is um, important to note is that we have an earlier phase, which lasts from about 200 to um, the late first century BCE. And then uh, the younger phase um, after the civil war from the late first century BC to the end of the first century CE. And this change in time will, will be important later on. Now let's give me a short introduction um, about the Xiongnu archaeology. Um, what is a really interesting case in this archaeology, in, in, in Xiongnu archaeology, is that in the second century BC, almost out of the sudden, we see um, across Mongolia and in southern Siberia the appearance of a standardized archaeological culture. And the contrast to the preceding archaeological culture, first there's about a hundred year hiatus, um, but the preceding um, culture is called slab burial culture, and I'm not going to, to tell you anything about it. It's not that um, that culture, there is a change towards a, you know, change in material culture, change in a bit in the burial rites. No, there's a complete disruption. And then we have a new archaeological culture and we have very, very little um, traces of the preceding cultures in the Xiongnu archaeological material record. So out of the blue, out of, out of the sudden, we see this massive spread of cemeteries, settlements, and um, special kind of cemeteries, the terrace tombs, I'll show you that later, um, appear in this, in, in this area with a center based in Mongolia, but we also see um, them a bit uh, in northern China. And there are now, furthermore, uh, this map was done in 2011. So now we have a much denser um, occupation and there are some more in um, Tuva. So we witness a drastic change in the archaeology, which coincides with uh, um, the, the chron Chinese chroniclers reporting that we have the Xiongnu Empire, which is why um, we are is allowed uh, to say um, that this archaeological culture is um, related to this Xiong, Xiongnu imperial structure that we know from the records. Now we do have cemeteries, a lot of them, you just saw a distribution map. They come in various shades and sizes. We have uh, um, several, the standard uh, form it looks from the top like a ring 
because they have all been reopened. So we barely know any uh, original, but uh, the original form of how the barriers was covered. They present themselves on the um, surface today as stone rings. We do have very few barriers that present themselves as insignificant stone clusters that cover a burial and the other one, uh, the, the other sort we have are flat graves, which are basically only um, either uh, detected when the people, uh, when the cemeteries are excavated completely and a lot of area of um, um, surface soil is removed or um, when uh, there is some building activity going on. So here is an example of a large cemetery which cluster in groups that are you already gives you an, a sense of that probably um, clan or family ties and organize such um, burial groups. And if we zoom into one of those burial groups up here, you can see that it consists of various ring barriers, but also flat graves. The most prominent social group that we see in those um, burials are uh, warriors and uh, they are associated with male barriers. Um, so when we have the anthropology uh, and we do have um, the um, warrior um, equipment, then uh, we both basically find uh, male individuals associated with the weaponry. Um, and what is significant is the improvement of the reflexive bow that the Xiongnu made, which gave them the military strength, among other things. And um, uh, the way they built uh, this reflexive bow is to strengthen it with some bone attachments to strengthen the ends, the middle, and again the end, and that allowed the um, bow to become quicker, to be quicker drawn, and to have more power. Um, and what comes also is that most of the um, arrowheads are made of iron, and this is part of a um, birch quiver that you can see. So this complex of um, usually the bow and arrow you find all the time in my male burials. What you see here those are little bone whistlers. Those are attachments made from bone, which have little holes. And um, when you shoot them, especially in, in, in larger quantities, they give a sound. And that must have given a screeching sound that the Chinese also wrote about and was um, rather scary for these um, uh, horsemen to um, when they came with these um, arrow attacks. Now, this female, the female sphere, uh, we also have um, a very prominent social group, and those are interestingly the mature um, either, so the older women in this um, society, and um, they are um, signified by very elaborate belts. Um, and uh, these belts have large clasps, um, these belt plaques, um, and um, they are furthermore very much decorated with rings as attachments. On the backside, you can sometimes see cowrie shells. You have a lot of beads hanging down from the belts. And um, this kind of equipment is only uh, for older females. While the uh, somewhat adult females or younger females, they can have very simple burials or um, with necklaces, some beads, pottery, uh, maybe here a cauldron, and this is already already at somewhat better because these are the remains of a of a, a ear cup um, that may or may not have been lacquered. In the late, uh, I already told you that we have um, a huge um, change uh, in by the late fir first century BC, um, and that is the burials. Um, we have a new kind of barrier and they're called terrace tombs and they're exclusively for the elite, but they are now monumental in size. When I say monumental in size, I mean that they are up to 46 meters in length and they can be 20 meters or 30 meters wide. And um, they are built, uh, not always, but mostly like an inverted pyramid and they can be up to 20 meters deep. Now, 
uh, you may think that such terrace tombs might be rare and they're called terrace tombs because on the surface they present themselves with, an, with a ramp that goes up to a platform and when you dig that down this platform then you come up with this inverted pyramid and down here is a burial chamber and in there is another uh, uh, wooden inset and then you have in this inset uh, the coffin. And the yeah, and this is about a depth of about twenty meters. So this is a massive labor effort, and um, uh, you may think that there are only very few of those. No, we do have um, hundreds of those in several cemeteries. Um, they consist of up to one hundred um, terrace tombs. Maybe not all twenty meter deep. Maybe only ten meters deep. But the um, amount of work labor of labor that goes into constructing these um, terrace tombs is um, tremendous. Now these elite burials were furnished with exotica um, and you when you excavate them most of what you excavate are Chinese goods. For example lacquer cups uh, on top of the burial chamber you find Chinese chariots mostly disassembled but all, uh, complete with a parasol and then you find the box and then the, the wheels uh, packed next to them. You find um, Chinese mirrors, you find Chinese attachments for um, anything, but you find um, uh, uh, this kind of horse gear that is decorating the saddlery of the horse and um, it is uh, on an iron backing gold foil and very often a unicorn or a yak is depicted and you find that with cloud symbols like it's very um, the, the symbol is, is taken over from China but it's it's locally ma made. Uh, we know from some of the gold analyses that at least in one case or in two cases we do not have many of those analyses. Local gold was used. And um, this prestigious horse gear um, signifies all these um, uh, elite terrace tombs inhabitants. Um, in pay, uh, please pay attention to this little small ornament, which is um, just a jewelry item um, uh, in the gold turquoise style, as we will see that more often in this talk. We also have in these um, terrace tombs that all belong to the younger phase. Uh, so the late first century C BCE, but mostly the early first century CE, we do also find Greco-Bactrian textiles as well as Roman glass. You can see here um, a complete um, glass bowl um, uh, from one of the Roman workshops or the workshops in the Rome, you know, associated with Roman empires outside of the Roman empire and a Hellen Hellenistic um, silver plate that was um, um, reworked in order to, to function as a decorative phalera for the horse gear. Um, so these prestigious items you find um, in, the, um, in these uh, terrace tombs, in these elites that belong to the younger phase. Now, our image um, of the nomad and our and, and in order to get closer to the life ways, the image of the nomad is of course heavily influenced or was heavily influenced by the Chinese sources. And, um, and that is still um, influencing research today. And we are just now for, for, for a decade or two decades coming closer to reconstructing the actual life waste um, through archaeological and bioarchaeological research. Um, and I think that is true for not only the Xunglu polity um, uh, as a pastoralist people, but for all Eurasian pastoralist people and their um, polities. Now, as I said, um, I will show um, uh, I will show you some of the archaeology of that in order to show you that um, uh, we can now um, um, reconstruct a much better picture of um, the life ways, and um, this is and uh, this is why we take a look at present day mobility in Mongolia, that, because it teaches us that um, and this is a, a diagram that. Um, 
um, uh, Jean-Luc Houl, a colleague, um, has uh, published uh, several years ago. Um, he shows you that uh, the mobility can range uh, uh, differently. And in this case, uh, between the movements between the summer camp and the winter camp can be up to 30 kilometers. But in uh, some uh, valleys of uh, central Mongolia, the, mo the, the, the movement from the winter camp to the summer camp uh, is only seven kilometers or 10 kilometers or 12 kilometers. So it's a very stationary kind of um, nomadism, so to speak, or yeah, pastoralism, nomadic pastoralism that is rather limited in its source. But in central Mongolia, that is um, possible. While, of course, in the very arid regions of the Gobi uh, in south Mongolia, uh, present day mobility um, needs a larger range and can also encompass up to 100 kilometers. Um, it is also uh, not always that they have four movements between the um, winter camp um, closer to up, up from the valleys, up the hills, in mostly in side niches and side valleys. And the summer camps are down by the river um, or in the, down in the valley. Um, and sometimes they have also um, spring camps and fall camps, but it's not necessary that all of these, you don't want that all of these um, uh, four steps are necessary. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. That, that depends totally on, on the year. It depends on the region within Mongolia. So one cannot, one has to reconstruct it for each community um, and cannot conclude that it's everywhere the same. We do have a large range of settlements actually, and um, that might come as a biggest surprise as the Chinese um, sources transmitted this image of the wandering uh, nomad. Uh, and um, we know most of the settlements from southern Siberia because there has been a long research tradition to take a look into those settlements, but we know very few of them from northern Mongolia, although ecologically um, that doesn't make any difference whether you are in, in southern um, Siberia in the Transbaikal area or in, in northern Mongolia. Um, and what you see is they have um, usually pit houses with um, which are reconstructed in this or in a similar manner. And um, the prominent, most prominent site is, is called Evolga, but we do also have others. We do also have residences. Those are walled sites, which uh, have um, uh, a function that is not yet completely cleared. But we can say the following. First of all, of course, settlement archeology span in Mongolia is only at its uh, beginnings. Then not many of these walled sites have been comprehensively investigated, meaning uh, there are some single trenches that give us a clue, but we do not know much. This is about uh, the most we can get out of the residency from Guadov, which has been uh, ex uh, investigated by a Korean uh, Mongol team. And um, what is very typical is you find a platform in the center or maybe two or three platforms and uh, you find openings with gates and you find elements of Chinese architecture like uh, architecture um, like tiles, Chinese tiles, uh, roof tiles, and um, you find almost no settlement debris, which is uh, why uh, we currently think that um, these sites themselves are no, um, not settlement sites or probably maybe temporary residences or res um, um, sites with, um, for a ritual function. However, um, I, um, maybe you remember from the beginning that the Chinese sources are also reported that there is the capital is called Longchang. And um, since 20 um, and up to 2020, we uh, didn't know where Longchang was, what the Chinese meant when they said Longchang. And uh, last year, the Mongol colleagues um, identified a site which is very unusually and um, it also it brought roof tiles with the tile inscriptions um, that say the dragon city which means Longchang in um, in uh, 
in English then when you translate it sort of. And what you see is it's not like the other walled sites, uh, only a square. Um, I know it's hard to see. I don't have an actual uh, drone image because it's a very new finding and the Mongol colleagues are, despite COVID, already working on it this year again now. And um, there is a square, but you see there are other structures attached to it. It's much larger. And that's why it makes perfect sense that maybe this is sort of a city, um, which is um, a very exciting uh, discovery of, of last year in Xiongnu archaeology. So that changes again our um, perception of um, the Xiongnu, and we'll see what comes out of that. But it's a, it's it's more than one of these residences and it's not like the other settlement sites. Now I want to talk a little bit about the um, subsistence economy, um, with, but I won't go into length here. Um, so basically it's, it's located in the steppes and um, the main nutrition comes from a pastoral regime. This has been confirmed by uh, bioarchaeological studies um, from the Max Planck Institute in Jena, headed by um, Sharon Wilkin, um, and, and other bioarchaeological studies that, uh, that are around by, um, it was spearheaded by um, Michel Machicek and also, also in, um, Alicia Ventresca Miller. Um, so from the bioarchaeological side, we know that uh, the main staple of the diet is, is our dairy products and meat products from the animals. But there is a regular intake of um, C4 grains, which is um, a millet in this case. And we have from the early Russian excavations in Ivolga, we have ample evidence also for agricultural tools. We have um, the seeds in these settlement excavations. So, um, and we know from uh, a large spread um, data from the bioarchaeology, bio we know that um, it was widespread, but uh, not every individual consumed uh, C4 grains um, as there are others which did not participate. So we think that it was, um, agriculture was practiced in several patches where it was possible uh, in order to, um, as, a, as just an addition to the um, pastoral re regime. What we know about the economy is due to the, the lack of good settlement archaeology, which still is in its infancy. Also production side um, are not uh, well studied, which is why we uh, know at the moment very few about, about very little about the um, social reconstruction of the um, where to situate the, the production, the bronze. We know, however, from um, from um, metallurgical analyses of bronzes, uh, we know that uh, it was quite an opportunistic um, a regime because uh, nothing was centralized in its production, but there are different regions that participate in different uh, ways in, in, in the production process because there is no standardization in the bronzes. Sometimes they were also re-smelting on Chinese metals and probably got metals also from another stock, maybe from the Minusinsk Basin in Siberia. Um, and yeah, that, that's the bronze regime. Iron, we do have several iron production sites by now over the past decade that have been excavated. And um, it is highly probable that um, the demand uh, in, in iron products was so high that they also developed um, a specific type um, of uh, furnace, uh, iron smelting furnaces. But that is currently uh, under research. With precious metal, there is oh, one study that shows also that um, local production was taking place because among the um, um, precious metal um, artifacts that we find in these um, uh, elite tombs, we see different styles that show that there are actually various centers or various masters um, uh, at work, which may uh, also uh, be, yeah, I, I would stick to several centers um, as um, uh, for now, because we don't know about the um, uh, handicrafts people 
in the um, Sunno Empire. And then another um, economical uh, 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 part uh, is um, a trade and the political relationships. One may not forget that the Xiongnu, um, they were so keen on this Heqing Treaty that I mentioned before, because it brought numerous goods and flooded, um, in principle, uh, flooded the um, uh, Xiongnu with Chinese goods. And those Chinese goods are less important in terms of agricultural produ products, but more important of they have silks and uh, Chinese objects and uh, and just everything. So basically when we excavate the Xiongnu burial, uh, although we never find silk because of preservation reasons, but we always find the incidents in almost all the graves. We find um, hints that silk was um, corroded to the, um, to the, to the metal, uh, to, the, to the iron, and we see traces of the silk fabrics in this corrosion. So there is a huge income from uh, influx from uh, China into this and um, the Xiongnu, they just mastered everything they could they get their hands on. Now within the Xiongnu, I suggest that we have to reckon with a prestige goods or somewhat wealth-based economy because we can see that status goods like highly expensive status goods such as um, a Chinese lacquerware. Chinese lacquer is a, such a very expensive product. It's a very complex production process that involves many steps and many specialized people. And so we see um, that among the Xiongnu, there are many remains it doesn't preserve well in the archaeological record. But we see numerous, many, many remains of um, uh, Chinese lacquer, not only in these terrace tombs I was talking about, but also in the more simpler equipped graves. And that's, um, that's just one example um, that uh, it's probably some kind of a prestige goods economy that um, where prestige goods trickle down or are distributed downwards in, in, in return for other favors or loyalties and services or and, yeah. And that makes, at the moment, the most sense in this, um, uh, to, to my knowledge. Now, with the, we also, there is a large uh, genetic study that has been conducted, which came out last year. And it shows you that the, um, the individuals who uh, lived in the Xiongnu Empire um, were, had very different um, origins that are local from the preceding slab grave culture. Um, also for in the north, there is um, um, the Sakli Uyo culture. So this is all uh, locally made of different tribes and it fits perfectly actually to what the Chinese sources say that uh, Mao Dun, he conquered many different tribes and many different people and just unified them under the term Xiongnu. In the later Xiongnu Empire, we see that there is an influx from um, the Sarmatians, which are at the Black Sea, or right outside of the screen, and um, also more influx to, from Han China. OK, while well, um, this is um, a short rundown of the archaeology um, of the um, Xiongnu, now I want to turn to the focus to what, what what kind of contacts can we trace to Central Asia or to the regions further west? I, I don't want to focus on China, which is usually in the focus for um, researchers, but today we want to show, uh, we want to focus on uh, relations to Central Asia. Now, the first thing that um, uh, we can say is that in the second to first century BCE, we have something like um, two larger interaction spheres. Now, this is the inter interaction sphere, which is dominated by the Xiongnu polity and the Minusins basin is integrated, but it doesn't appear to belong. It doesn't, it, it's not integrated into the empire, but we see um, that in this area, the expression of status uh, in the second and first century, for early first century BC, are these open work belt plaques that I mentioned. And in the Western area, 
there is apparently also the idea at the same time to um, express status with um, open work belt plaque, but those are very differently made and they also have very different um, symbols, mostly camels, and they are integrated in a frame where an animal is kneeling or fighting, while the Xunglu, they have different topics. However, there's one type of belt plaque that you find in all the areas um, that crosses these, uh, across these um, interaction spheres. Um, you see a concentration here in, in Northern Mongolia, you see um, one in Central Asia, and you see them in Eurasia. And here is the, just this map of these um, belt plaques. And um, here are different types, and you see they are very much alike across all Eurasia. And um, in, if you put them in color, some of them are well made. They are from jetstone, with uh, sometimes with inlays of coral and turquoise. If you look at the context of these, um, um, this specific type of belt plaque, you find them only in warrior graves. Um, across your Asia. So let's start in the east in, in Diristu in uh, southern Siberia. You find them in, um, in a, a very local um, Xiongnu burial with the uh, armor of the bow and arrow in Central Asia. You find it equipped with a warrior who has similar um, bow and arrow equipment and a dagger with local pottery. And in the, among the summations at the lower Don, um, you find them in a niche burial, um, again, a different burial type and local pottery and incorporated with uh, a local um, male warrior. So in this warrior context, we see there is um, a similar, um, similar material culture, a similar expression of status and belief. Now in Kazakhstan, in the, we see uh, here is one of those belt plaques that I showed you, and you see, despite the fact that it has a somewhat different form, it you know it's rounded on the one end, it's not rectangular, but you see also that it has this crisscross pattern. It's also inlaid with turquoise and um, jade, and also this kind of rings you find in 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 in. Um, in Mongolia with the Xiongnu, you find this kind of bone strengtheners with the Xiongnu, with the Xiongnu you find also the Chinese areas, you find also this iron arrowheads, you find these open work bell pendants. So there is, um, in uh, Kazakhstan, there are individual graves, not many, and there is not much, but there are individuals that um, are locally buried, but have um, material culture that comes from the Xiongnu. There are buried, however, in their own uh, uh, burial rites and with their own burials and with the local pottery. If uh, I want to skip this part, which is prior to the Xiongnu, but um, it just shows you that the agrarian states are here in, in the south and um, the first power center forms in the Altai region. Um, and um, there you have um, Indian and uh, Chinese mirrors. Now, with the um, establishment of the Xiongnu, we, we have also something that inner Asia fashioning is going across um, the Eurasian steppes. And I already showed you these specific belt plaques. Now there is also other things and I will short you, short, show you some of them. Um, one is the um, daggers with four, four lobe dagger sheaths. Again, you can find them in um, uh, warrior burials or um, as depictions. So it started out in the third, second century in the Altai with the Pazari culture, which had these kind of daggers. And um, then you find them across uh, the Eurasian set up to the Black Sea area. Um, in, in different shades and grades, and that is usually mostly the late first century BCE or the first century CE. And in Western Asia, you find depictions of them, and they're all rooted in kingly context. So these are two examples of um, elite burials. One is from Tilia Tepe. Um, you find um, these four low dagger sheaves made in turquoise gold style, and you find a very similar one in the Don um in in the black sea area and um 
yeah, and and you see um, there's there's it's also made in the um, um, gold turquoise style, and both burials are belong to the highest echelon of the social rank that we see. While in Central Asia, also we see depictions, and they're also um, they're always um, shown with um, images of kings um, and go yeah. So there are attributes that um, are either insignia or attributes of status um, that. That is something that is shared across this vast space. Similarly, also discs, um, cheek pieces with disc shaped endings um, are um, shared um, across um, this area. So you find them among the Xiongnu and you find them in a, in, in a different style, but um, the idea is the same um, 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 at the Black Sea area. And in Central Asia, you don't find them. But it's only uh, because they didn't bury the um, um, horse gear in uh, the burials. And so we find, however, a depiction of it. And this is the famous um, burial from Orlad in Uzbekistan, which shows um, uh, horse riders attacking, uh, you, shows your war. And these riders, these um, warriors on horseback which have no stirrups and which have bow and arrow reflexive bow and the quiver just similar to what we have seen in the burials and they have horses and the horse gear is um are depicted as cheek pieces with disc shaped endings so um plus this warrior also had iron arrowheads he had just like uh, uh similar bone strengthen us for the bow and similar other elements that we also find with the Xiongnu. So the social context of this is clear. It's the, um, it's the highest status people that we can find. But we also find more simpler objects. And I show you one that now goes in the other direction um, in order to save some time. And uh, because, for example, Egyptian faience, you find them among the Sarmatians in the Black Sea area, you find them all over Central Asia, you find them, but also in the Taklamakan, and you find them also with the Insumnu burials. Now, in the first century CE, um, the bling, as you can already see on, on this image, changes. And we find um, this um, very similar style of this gold turquoise style across the Eurasian steppes, and it always consists of these um, round shaped um, um, turquoise, and they are encased in, in with with filigree or imitation of um, filigree, um, and uh, you find them on various objects, not only jewelry, but then also on weaponry and so on. But it's not only this gold turquoise style um, that functions like um, an, uh, a global expression, that functions like an expression of elite status, which is globally understood and globally shared. Glo with globally, I mean, from the Eastern Eurasian steppes through Central Asia to um, the Black Sea area. But you also find um, tamgas, which are signs that uh, signify objects, probably maybe a clanship symbol. Of course, we don't know exactly what's what's the meaning of those. Uh, but you find them also with the summation and you find them also within, uh, in Central Asia. And the links between Central Asia and the Black Sea area are well known and um, this is as close as it can get. The famous um, diadem from Kargali in Kazakhstan, um, also made in the gold turquoise style, finds it's very similar a correlate in Kopyakovo in the Black Sea area. Um, so what is he prominent for the eye is the style in which these um, objects are manufactured. And it's, um, it's sort of a globally um, accepted expression of elite um, status. Now, what do the, why do the Xiongnu, what, what's happening with the Xiongnu on the, this Eastern end is we don't find these, um, we don't find many Western goods uh, and objects and with Western, I mean, Central Asian and beyond like Black Sea area in uh, burials of the second century BCE. But we find them in 
in, in larger quantities in burials of the first century CE. And um, this Bricobactrian textile is just one example that we find there. And this Hellenistic um, disc is another, as is the Roman uh, bowl. But these Western exotica um, only show up um, uh, in, these, in these late burials. And it may be that they extended, I think, the demand of the Xiongnu economy, of this um, prestige goods economy, demanded that uh, when, when it came to this large explosion of these terrace tombs, that um, something exotic had to be in there. And um, now that uh, they had lots of stuff from China, but um, that really made a difference to have stuff from the West. Now, while we have this assimilation in inner Asian fashioning or um, the similar style of elite um, representation, we also see that the, con the context of Chinese goods at the same time also belongs to the elite context. And this is the um, example from one burial is from Koktepe, um, which the French um, had excavated in a mission and um, also you see that this, um, yeah, this is a very um, prestigious tomb, the tomb Omer, the lady has this filigree around on her clothing with gold and a Chinese mirror and a cauldron and uh, all sorts of things. Similarly, in the Black Sea area, Chinese goods are also incorporated in these elite tombs. And if you look at the distribution of, for example, Chinese lacquerware, uh, which is very expensive, as I explained earlier, um, you see the distribution is um, in Mongolia with a, uh, in, in what we delineate as the Xiongnu Empire, you find them in Central Asia, and we find them also in the Black Sea area. That the number of, uh, of lacquerware we find in the Western Eurasian uh, parts is so low has to do simply with uh, preservation issues and with recognition issues. I think um, in several reports in, 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 in Russian literature, you can read of um, red leather, leather fragments. And um, only when you have larger of, um, you know, larger parts of these fragments preserved, you can sometimes see that it's not actually leather, but it's lacquer. While uh, the, the, the Mongol archeologists there are so, they have seen so many lacquer fragments um, across um, their um, excavations. They uh, never have lack of uh, leather fragments. They immediately know it's lacquer. So, and only this was, yeah, this is sometimes it's well preserved and sometimes it's bad preserved, but I'm very sure that there are more than just three, three export goods. Um, the same is true, it's much easier with the Chinese mirrors, they preserve well and you see um, a, a load of mirrors come from Mongolia, you see them also in Central Asia, and you see them in the um, Black Sea region. Now what is interesting, once these, um, so there is something like a magical line in, in Central Asia, and once, uh, once the, the Chinese goods only appear in a context in uh, Western Eurasia that mostly belong to the first century CE, not before. While in the Xiongnu Empire, these goods have been circulating around already in the um, late second century uh, and first century BC. Um, so now the question is, uh, what does this all have to do with the Xiongnu and with the Silk Road and how can we explain things? Now, as you see, this is just one image I took uh, for representing the so-called Silk Road, this trade network and contact network that is crisscrossing um, Eurasia and basically connects the agrarian empires. Um, and we have, we, we know very little about what is going on. We only know archeologically what is going on um, north of this. And, um, the Chinese goods are always said that they are distributed through this um, trade network um, out of China to the West. While what I have showed you, this inner Asian fashioning um, and the sharing of a, a artistic vocabulary, um, of course, cannot be explained by commercial exchange across Eurasia. Um, 
it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive, these two images, but what I suggest uh, is that the that there is a salient affiliation network of elites that works across the steps. And that is independent from whatever China does or even the, the agrarian empires do, because it has a longer tradition. It goes back uh, a while and it has been intensified during the um, uh, first century BC and then especially in the first century CE. So these two images are not mutually inclusive, but more um, complementary um, to each other. And they, this step network does explain how you can um, find, um, why you find objects that are typical for the Xiongnu across all the Eurasian steps, and why you find um, small items like glass beads or faience beads in um, Inner Asia or with the Xiongnu. Um, you remember that I said uh, that there is a huge change among the um, Xiongnu um, during the first century BCE. And this also um, is true for changes in the connectivity to the West. So this is a, just a scheme. Uh, and here you see the earlier time period. And what we see is um, that we do have in all these areas a warrior elite, but we don't have these ostentatious burials that in during this time. We have well-equipped burials, richly equipped burials, um, and we have a warrior elite and they share a status symbol and that is spelled and each region or each of these um, interaction spheres has, different, has sort of a different vocabulary which they share. And then they share also across all these areas, this one type of belt plaque. And it's only actually this one type of belt plaque that we can trace uh, throughout the steps. While in the um, later phase, which is the late uh, first century BCE and the first century CE, we see the emergence of uh, ostentatiously furnished burials. They are shiny, they are glory, they are uh, with a tremendous amount of workforce um, established with a tremendous amount of wealth. And we find them not only with the Xiongnu uh, where um, yeah, it's almost ridiculous how many uh, terrace tombs we have, but we find them also in Central Asia. When you think of the burials of um, Tilia Tepe or Kok Tepe, and uh, we find them also at the Black Sea, when you think of these um, um, burials of Kobyakovo and Dachi and others. Now, I call them here high status persons. Um, it seems that um, the expression of being elite, there is an urge or there is a larger need to show, um, to show off because that subsides in the um, subsequent um, time period again. So it, it rises and it subsides. And what they share is not only technology, military technology like the reflexive bow with bow and arrow, they also have this um, um, insignia um, vocabulary that they share, and they share certain kinds of exotica, like like the mirrors for in in the female sphere, and um, uh, there is a qualitative change going on in these dynamics. How the how Eurasia is uh, connected, and uh, this is where I want to conclude my um, lecture, and I want to, would like to thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to hear more questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Brosseder. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to take um, questions, but could you please first give your summary in Russian? Ah, yes, so? okay, sorry. Yes. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then, уровни русского языка у меня очень э, сложно и очень примитивно, но надеюсь все таки, что вы понимаете, что я хочу сказать. Но сначала в моем лекции, в моем докладе я э, сначала говорила про империю Хуну о, или Сюну по э, китайские э, источники, и э, 